everyone, and welcome to the session. Today, we're going to talk about how to visualize Cloud Big Table access patterns uh, with visual analytics. And with us today, we have Steve Nimitz from Twitter, and we have Wim DePaul, uh, an engineering manager of Google Cloud. My name is Misha Brookman, and I'm a product manager on Big Table on Google Cloud. With that, Steve, take it away. Thank you. All right, so hey, everybody. I'm uh, Steve Nimitz. I'm a software engineer at Twitter. Um, I'm the team lead for our revenue data analytics product. Um, we basically focus on ser serving uh, analytic queries um, specifically for our advertiser analytics. Um, so let's talk about Twitter a little bit, just a little background for people unfamiliar with it. Um, so uh, we have around 300 plus uh, million monthly active users. Um, of those users, they're generally generating around 100 million tweets per day. Um, that turns into something like 300 petabytes of data that we have stored on HDFS. Um, and we're a global company. We have uh, pops in over five continents. Um, so specifically now, let's talk about advertiser analytics. So we have all those users interacting on the platform. Um, our advertiser analytics product is what we use um, to provide to our advertisers in order to um, get information on how their ads and campaigns are performing. Um, so they can see things like um, spend, spend breakdown, impressions, uh, clicks, all these metrics um, in real time through uh, UIs that we provide to them and also um, APIs uh, for our more advanced advertisers. Um, so the scale that we operate on here is, is pretty large. We have over uh, hundreds of thousands of active advertisers at any given times. Those advertisers are running lots of campaigns. Um, and all those campaigns are generating hundreds of thousands of events per second. Um, those could be coming from client events, um, from the web browsers, mobile apps, all that stuff. Um, but even internal uh, applications that we have, like our ad serving infrastructure, um, those are all generating events that go through our pipeline. So all in all, it's around 20 terabytes a day of raw log data. Um, and our pipelines will take that and compress it down and aggregate it to about uh, eight terabytes a year of data. So uh, in all, our, our analytic data set size is, is somewhere on the order of 50 terabytes, but growing as we speak right now. Um, so let's talk about what are the requirements that we need to provide and the SLOs we try to achieve um, for this analytic service that we provide. Um, the queries need to be fast. So these things are powering interactive UIs. They're uh, powering APIs that our advertisers are using. Um, so we try to shoot for pretty tight SLAs. Um, our SLA is uh, 4.5 seconds on many of these queries, pretty much all of the queries, um, which can be for things like give me three years of data hourly or give me uh, the last week of data um, just aggregated together. Um, we generally have around 5,000 QPS, um, which turns into around a gigabyte a second of data that we're processing at any given time um, just for query execution. Um, and we, we obviously have a, a pretty high SLO on uptime, uh, 9997. Um, so let's talk more about the queries we're serving here. Um, so things like give me all of the uh, impressions that my promoted tweets have generated for the last seven days. Um, show me the spend that my campaigns have had over the last month totaled up and summed together. Um, let's say give me the impressions by day um, for only app installs by iOS users. Um, so we get really granular with some of these queries um, and can break them down and segment them many ways. Um, and then other things like hourly spend broken down by geography. So like how much have people in Japan spent on, uh, on tweets? Um, all of these things um, can turn into some problems that we'll run into when we try to scale system uh, off-the-shelf systems up. Um, the dimensionality of this data is very high. Um, we have at least 20 high, high cardinality dimensions, um, so things like geography, interest, things like that. Um, and additionally, we also have another 20 or so lower cardinality dimensions um, that we need to query over. Um, so a lot of the systems we've looked at weren't really designed for this level of uh, QPS and latency. Um, they were more for ad hoc internal analytics of like maybe there's a, a BA that's trying to do some investigation and is just running a couple queries per minute. Um, so that brings us to why we used uh, Cloud Bigtable. Uh, we decided to use this as our analytic database um, and basically build uh, analytic product on top of it. Um, so reasons we chose it, it's fully managed, which is awesome. Like, 
we don't have to run any hardware, we don't have to run any software, we don't have to worry about upgrading it ever, um, all of that's handled for us. Um, it's very scalable and it's very easy to scale. I can just go into the UI or use the API or whatever and add another 20 nodes and scale up my cluster by 20% and it, it just happens instantly. I don't have to worry about requisitioning hardware and, and getting that kind of stuff. Um, it's very high performance, um, it's, it's basically linearly scalable to any size, assuming you have good uh, key design, which we'll talk about later in this. Um, and the, the actual schema and the design of the system makes it really well sorted for uh, the high performance time series analytics that we want to do. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Misha to talk more about Bigtable. Thank you, Steve. So let's talk about Google Cloud Bigtable and the feature set that it provides to enable Steve and his team to do the analytics at scale. So what is Bigtable? Bigtable is a sparse, distributed, persistent, multidimensional sorted map. That's the description that you can see in the paper from 2006. So let's dive into details for a bunch of these different attributes and see how they work in practice. Bigtable is a distributed key multi-value store. It is sparse in the sense that unwritten cells don't take up any space, so you don't have to fill out every single cell in every single row for every single column family. It supports atomic single row transactions, so you can modify any values across any of the column families. And it has a single index, which is the row key. So there are no secondary indices for any of the columns that you see, except for the row key. In, in this table, you can see how you would access the different cells in the table by using the row key, column family, and column qualifier to uniquely identify them. Cloud Big Table supports the multidimensional map model as follows. For a tuple of values, the row, which is a string, a column, which is a combination of column family and an optional column qualifier, together with an N64 timestamp, given all of those values, you can retrieve the value. And the value is an uninterpreted array of bytes. And so here you can see that you have a built-in time dimension that you can use to store time series. In fact, while most databases are two-dimensional, Bigtable is actually three-dimensional. So the third dimension in Bigtable is time. Every cell has an arbitrary number of versions, and there's an N64 attached to each one of those cell versions. You can treat them as time. You can also treat them as an arbitrary version ID, so you could just give them numeric incrementing numbers. You can store an arbitrary number of them, but you can also enable automatic garbage collection, either based on time or based on counts. So you don't have to manually go in and clean up and delete the unnecessary values. You can keep just writing into Bigtable, set a policy, and Bigtable will asynchronously remove data after some time or after you've reached the limit, such as you say, keep the last five values, and Bigtable will automatically garbage collect them asynchronously over time. Let's talk about the request routing mechanism in Bigtable. Bigtable clients connect to a single endpoint, which is the load balancing proxy layer, and it then forwards the requests to the Bigtable nodes that serve the data. In the following set of slides, I'm going to remove the load balancing proxy layer for clarity, but keep in mind that clients don't necessarily connect directly to the Bigtable nodes. The requests are routed through this API layer. So here you can see that clients are connecting to Bigtable. Bigtable doesn't actually store any data, which is kind of interesting for a database. Bigtable itself is stateless because it stores all the data in Colossus, our distributed file system. Here you can see that a Bigtable node manages data without holding onto the data in Colossus. So Bigtable nodes have exclusive read-write access to sections of the data in a table to provide the atomicity of updates to a single row. So every row in Bigtable is exclusively managed by at most one node. Nodes don't talk to each other, so there are no cross-row transactions in this case. But this allows for very quick scalability. Here, the A, B, C, D, and E are sorted key ranges within a single table. So as we mentioned earlier, the storage model sorts the keys in the table to allow you for fast linear scans. Now let's say we have a single node that is getting a lot of activity because there's a lot of popular data that is being accessed by a bunch of clients. What Bigtable can do is simply reassign the ownership of that data to a different node, and that is an online operation without any data motion. So regardless of the gigabytes or terabytes of data that you've just reassigned, this is an online operation and we're without any data copying. The data stays exactly where it was in Colossus, and this is just a metadata update to show that there's new owner of this data and the requests flow automatically. The client is completely unaware of this because their requests are automatically forwarded by the load balancing proxy layer that I mentioned earlier. So clients don't need to do any discovery or any updates or management of who do they need to connect to. They have a single endpoint, they connect to that, and the requests are routed automatically, even when the data is rebalanced and reassigned at scale. 
this ability to easily reassign the data and the strong separation between the processing and storage enables the simple scalability that Steve mentioned earlier. Which, what this means is that if we add another node to the cluster, as you can see here, we can easily shard and reassign the data to other nodes. And so the cluster will scale in performance in linear order compared with the number of nodes in the cluster. You don't have to do anything to enable this. You just add more nodes to the cluster, and you get the additional throughput in the cluster given the size of the nodes. Similarly, of course, you can shrink down the cluster, and we will again resize and rebalance the assignments to fit that smaller cluster. What this means is that you can get, you can get seamless scalability uh, in scaling for Cloud Bigtable without any downtime. And as Steve alluded, you get the linear scalability if you have good schema design. Now, what does that mean to have good schema design? We'll, we'll talk about this in a bit uh, as to how you can get good schema design and what it actually means for Bigtable and what performs well. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about some of the recent features that we've announced for Cloud Bigtable. Yesterday, we announced that Cloud Bigtable now supports replication, and it, it is now generally available. There are no manual steps to enable replication and synchronization or any steps to repair your data or anything to synchronize on your writes or deletes. This is automatically handled for you as soon as you add another cluster to an instance. And some of the use cases that you might consider for this are either high availability for serving or workload separation for batch and serving use cases. As I mentioned, it's GA as of yesterday. It increases the SLA from 99.5 to 99.95 and a zero touch failure for HA. So with that, let's return a bit to the role schema design and how that impacts performance. As Steve mentioned, good row key schema design is crucial for performance to get the linear scalability. Because the row key schema design will guide the access patterns, and you want to make sure that your access patterns scale linearly to enable the scalar, linear scaling for the performance in your big table cluster. If you have uneven access patterns, you will end up with hotspots. If you're storing too much data due to the row key schema design in a single row, you will also have, a, you have trouble doing that because since we cannot split a single row across multiple nodes in Bigtable, you will have single servers that are really tr hard trying to serve a single row that may be gigabytes in size. So in, in the end, you really want balanced access patterns. You want reasonably sized rows, and that will provide the linear scalability that you have with Bigtable. Traditional monitoring involves line charts such as this one, where you can look at uh, CPU utilization, you can see latency, you can see data stored and such. So this will show you, for example, this graph, uh, CPU utilization you know, on average in a, in a cluster. We also have CPU utilization for the hottest node in your cluster, which might hint at a possibility of hotspots. But what if you wanted to know more? What if you wanted to see what is actually happening under the covers, and how is it that you can improve your rookie schema design to improve performance? How would you know if you have large rows? How would you know that there's a MapReduce that may be affecting your serving latency? How would you debug if you really have high CPU and find what the cause of that high CPU might be? With that, I want to hand it over to Wim, who will talk about a new feature for Cloud Bigtable Key Visualizer. Wim? Thank you, Michel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wim Depau. I'm the engineering manager of the Visual Analytics team in New York. And very proud to announce Key Visualizer for Cloud Bigtable. This is a novel approach to analyze the behavior of your table. You saw the line chart before. Well, typical line charts, they only show one dimension. We show read and write access patterns, both over time and the key space. This will help you find and prevent hotspots. You can find rows with too much data. And you can see if your key schema is balanced. This is the heat map of Key Visualizer. It will show time horizontally. It proceeds from left to right. This example shows one week of behavior of your big table. The key space is shown vertically with the lowest keys at the bottom and the highest keys at the top. Then there's the heat scale. You can see it has colors from cold in black for zero. And then it goes to dark blue, red, yellow, to glowing white, hot, for extremely high values. In this example here, you can see a diurnal pattern. You see this lowest key range over here? Well, there's about seven hotspots here. So someone must have hammered that key range very heavily every night. Over there, you see a cold area, because it's practically completely dark. And this horizontal line in the middle that is glowing white must be a key that has been used very, very heavily. In this example here, you see a diagonal line. 
which is probably a sequential scan from a MapReduce job. And then if you in Key Visualizer, if you hover with the mouse over the screen, you'll see in the tooltip more details, like the actual value, the precise time, and then the, the start and the end key of the region that you're hovering over. Around the heat map, you'll see at the bottom and on the right aggregate values in bar charts. So here at the bottom, you see averages over the visible key space in 15-minute intervals. This is pretty much what you would see in your traditional line chart. On the right side here, there's another bar chart that shows you averages over visible time range per key range. You see that spike over here? Remember, that was that bright, yellow, that bright white line of that hotkey that we had in the middle. Now, when we were observing big table application developers at Google, we observed that very often, although not always, they were creating their keys in a hierarchical value, in a hierarchical way. So they were using prefixes and concatenating these prefixes, a little bit like this example. This example here uses slashes and dashes. It could be other symbols, too. And so we thought, we're going to, in Key Visualizer, extract the prefix tree so that you can see your key schema in the heat map. So the result of that will show, will look something like that. So here you see an icicle chart. And the leftmost tall, thin rectangle here shows you the top prefix. And then as you go right, you see prefixes going down the hierarchy. Why is this useful? Well, first of all, you can now see your key schema of the data that you designed. And hopefully, you can recognize the data that you stored that way. The other thing is that we often observed that the behavior is correlated with the uh, key layout. So in this example here, this is a very small key range. And you see that corresponds to a series of key prefixes here. And it's a very distinct pattern. You see this on and off pattern over four days over here all correlated with the key prefix. Key Visualizer gives you 11 metrics. First of all, we give you ops, which is the sum of reads and writes. Then we give you three warning metrics that can point you to possibly bad performance. I'll talk about that later on. Then we have reads, writes. We have performance metrics like latency, and finally, we have the amount of data that is stored per row. Let me show you now some common key access patterns. So over here, you see an imbalanced key space. Again, remember, time goes horizontally from left to right. And you see that about 20% of the top uh, keys here were very heavily used. They're glowing um, yellow and, and red, whereas the 80% at the bottom they're barely used, because you can see that it's very cold. In this example, you see that your database was pretty much cold uh, over the whole key spectrum. But then all of a sudden, at this time, you see a very sudden increase for a key range uh, from here to here. When we look at that example here, you see that everything is pretty much cold, except for a few glowing white keys. So that's an example of a, a couple of hotspots that we see here. And then finally, in this example, this is the same example that I pointed you out in the previous slides here. You see this diagonal line, which is probably a sequential read uh, caused by a MapReduce job. Now, Key Visualizer is not just about visualization. It's also about analysis. Analysis on possibly trillions of metric values. So imagine if you have a database with a trillion rows. If we want to show that behavior on your laptop, we have to downsample and aggregate it in one way or another, right? To get it to your laptop in less than a minute. So we have to aggregate and downsample all these um, performance metrics. Then, on the other hand, we also analyze every single performance value that we collect in the system, and they're very detailed. The result of that is three metrics. The first one is the read pressure index. And that is a function, an opaque function of read CPU 
read queue length, which is the number of read operations waiting to be executed, and latency. And that function can point you to possibly bad read performance. We have something similar for write behavior. And then finally, we have large rows, uh, which will point you to any rows that contain more than one gigabyte of data. Now, this is a massive amount of calculations and data that we analyze. But the good news is that this has absolutely no performance impact on your cluster. Absolutely not. And it's all for free. This is an example here of a high read pressure. You see this uh, glowing spot. Now, some of you may think, well, this may be a little bit overwhelming because I have 11 metrics. I have all that data. Where do I start? We made it easy for you. So when you open Key Visualizer, it opens with ops. That's the default metric. And what it shows you is just an overview of your activity. You see if there's any hot regions, any cold regions, if you have any diurnal patterns, any linear scans. And then you'll see if there's any warnings at the top bar. If there aren't any warnings, that's good news. Um, then. There's nothing to do. You can just relax. If there are warnings, and they will show up like this example over here, then you click on the button to see which keys and when they were causing problems. I'm going to show you an example now. So imagine you open Key Visualizer in the Ops view. You see an overview of your behavior. This is one week. And you see what's hot and what is cold and the diurnal patterns. And over there which I've annotated in the red rectangle, you see this read pressure warning. It has three exclamation marks, so that means it's severe. I click on that button, and it brings me immediately to the read pressure index metric. Do You see this glowing white stripe over here? So when I hover over it with the tooltip, I see immediately the details of the problems. And so I've got a list of problems here. But the most severe one is the one at the top here, which I've annotated with the, the red rectangle. And I'm going to zoom in into that now. So what is this? Well, you see it's glowing, so it's, it's bad. So first of all, this is a single key. And it's been stressed for two hours and a half. So that's pretty long. The other thing which you can see is the exact name of the offending key, shown over here in the second line. And why do we think that it's bad? Well, look at the total read CPU. It's using 446 million nodes, which is roughly half a server worth of CPU. Remember, this is just for one key, right? And then we also give the potential culprit the suggestion of what probably was um, causing this. Well, we're dealing with a, a large row here. So look at this. This is 10.38 gigabyte. And you know that the recommended row size, the maximum row size in Bigtable is 256 megabyte. So this is way too much, of course. Right? So imagine someone is hammering that key very hard, pulling out all that data. And each time, they're pulling out 10 gigabytes. So no wonder that this is going to use a lot of CPU. See, this is how easy it was. I open Key Visualizer. I look at the overview, click on the, uh, alarm, the alert buttons, and it shows me the, uh, the problem. What we've shown you so far are metrics that are showing, or, or views that are showing one metric. For example, ops. And you can imagine that you're looking at a, a read hotspot, and you may want to know, well, am I also writing at this time and space and place? And you switch to writing, and then you want to see, is there any latency? And you switch to latency. And so this was a little bit cumbersome. We thought um, to make this a little bit easier. So this. New feature, which we probably will launch in a couple of weeks from now, is the multiple metrics view. So here in the middle, you see what we had before when uh, I hover with my cursor over an area. I see in the tooltip the values. But now at the same time, I see all the metric values for each metric uh, over there on the right side. So this, this lets you compare and correlate metrics simultaneously just in one view. In this example here, you see that the reads that are in purple, they're somewhat lukewarm, whereas the writes 
they're bright yellow. So we're doing not so much reading, but a lot of uh, writing in this example. And then there's the Expand All button over there. So if I click on that one, this will bring up miniature views for each metric that are showing the same window as the main view. So here I had ops. Over there, I had uh, the number of bytes written over here. I have uh, the number of data stored, and here the number of rows. And if I hover with the cursor over the main view, the cursor will simultaneously change over here, and you see the corresponding metrics also. If I zoom in and out, and if I pan in the main view, all of these view will just uh, move and, and uh, will be zooming in um, synchronized. So that will be coming in a couple of weeks. Let me summarize to um, give you again the, a couple of the benefits that I demonstrated so far. So it helps you detect and prevent key access hotspots. It helps you find large rows, more than one gigabyte. And there's no performance impact for you at all. And, and it's free. One use case that I did not illustrate over here is how to optimize your key schema. And that's what Steve is now going to talk about, because he used Key Visualizer for that purpose. Thank you. Um, so as Wim introduced, uh, now we're going to talk about how we use this feature while we were developing our um, analytics product in order to tune and really optimize um, the, the data. Um, so one of the things we realized while we were building this um, is that the, the key schema and the row key schema really matters a lot for how well the performance of your um, big table will be. Um, again, poor key schema design will end up with a very non-scalable uh, big table design. Um, so a few common things that we realized we need to do is that um, we should tune our data to the query patterns that we were expecting, which kind of makes sense. Um, so and building our row keys, we basically want the queries, um, the dimensions in those queries, to match the row key um, from, left to, from left to right. So you have some dimensions. You put them in your row key in a serialized form. Um, you want to be able to match them left to right to get optimum uh, data querying um, in, your, in your queries. Um, also, you want your row keys to be well distributed across the whole key space. Um, otherwise, you're not going to have a very linearly scalable system, because only certain nodes will be serving a majority of the data. Um, and also, you want your queries to have um, the minimum number of scans required uh, in order to make it um, to keep your commonly accessed data together. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to introduce um, just an example kind of toy schema that's a simplified version of what we use for our actual advertiser analytics. Um, and we'll walk through um, some simulated traffic on it and see what they looked like in key, schema, uh, in key visualizer and how we improved the design. Um, so here's some simple dimensions. Um, you can imagine advertiser ID is just the ID we give any advertiser that signs up with us. Um, a campaign ID is a, a campaign they're running. So maybe it's an ad they're showing, something like that. Uh, Timestamp is the, the time the uh, data that we're querying corresponds to. Um, generally, we, we group things into an hour granularity. So the timestamp will be at the hour level. Um, engagement type is just kind of like what the user did to engage with the ad. Did they view it? Did they click on it? Um, did they install an application? Something like that. Um, and then display location is where it was on the page. Like, was it in their timeline? Was it a search result? Things like that. Um, so basically, our first iteration was really simple. So let's take all of these dimensions, concatenate them together from left to right, um, and that becomes our row key. So timestamp, advertiser ID, campaign ID, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some pros here. Um, it's really easy to scan across all advertisers if you have a time range. Um, and generally, all of our queries will have a time range in them. Um, you have good data locality, because all the data for an advertiser is grouped together. Um, but now, let's check out the cons. So this is a, a view of what our, our key schema, or our key visualizer looks like with this schema. Um, this isn't great. So we have here, there's a big spot of basically no traffic. Um, up here, you can see there's a very pronounced line of, uh, of hot keys 
um, which generally will correspond to the current week of data we're looking at here. Um, most of the queries for our data that we have are querying for the most recent data. That makes sense. People care more about what's happening now than what happened in the past. Um, so this isn't great. This is not a really good uh, design. If we had run this in production, we'd probably have very hot nodes all the time, because whatever node was hosting this small key range in the middle here would be overloaded all the time. Um, so let's iterate. Let's, let's take what we learned here um, and see what we can do. So we learned timestamp was not great to put in the front. Um, so let's swap timestamp and advertiser ID. What this is going to do now is the advertiser ID is at the beginning of my key. Um, and the timestamp is within, the, within there. So it's still easy to scan for a time range within an advertiser. Um, it's harder to query for all advertisers. However, in our use cases, that's not really something we care about. Um, use, advertisers coming in are only looking at their data. Obviously, we're not going to let them query for anything. Um, so although we, we have a con here, it's not really the end of the world. Um, it doesn't really fit our use case anyways. So let's look at what happens here. Um, we got a little better. So the, there's, there's more distribution. Um, however, we still have some hot keys, um, some hot ranges here. Um, these most likely will correspond to advertisers that are more frequently um, querying for their data. Additionally, our advertiser ID keys might not be very well distributed across the entire key space. They're probably sequentially generated integers or something. Um, so in that case, we'll end up with groupings of like, we probably generated a bunch of IDs here and then here. Um, and those are all um, groups of advertisers. So let's iterate again. Um, we've learned that we put adver advertiser ID in front. Things worked out a little better. Um, however, we didn't get a good distribution on that advertiser ID key space. Um, so instead, let's reverse the advertiser ID. Basically, the first digit is now the last digit, which will basically synthetically distribute the keys a lot better, because now instead of um, the most significant bit that's generally not changing much, you have the least significant bit, which is always cycling all the time, because we're, if they're sequentially generated IDs. Um, so pros and cons are basically the same now. There's not, not a big difference, um, other than you couldn't scan advertiser IDs sequentially, but we don't care. That's not a use case anyways. So this is what we end up with. Everything looks pretty good. Um, we still have some, some rows here, which correspond probably to more uh, more frequently accessed advertisers that are pulling their data more. But in general, the key space is really well distributed um, across basically the entire, the entire range. Um, this is what we want it to look like. Um, and, and this will lead to a really well-performing design. Um, so the really important thing here is because we were able to do this, um, it really gave us confidence that when we took this uh, product and went live with it, that we wouldn't end up with like horrible performance issues, um, and we wouldn't have to redesign it in a year because it wouldn't scale. Um, it's also been really helpful for us um, if we have a, a production issue come up, like, oh, like why, why is our um, latency going up for certain advertisers or things like that? We can go right into Key Visualizer and see what's happening at the time. And now I'm going to hand it over to Misha. So as you've, used, as you've seen, uh, Steve at Twitter were, was able to use Bigtable at the scale that Twitter needs to do visual analytics and serve their ads analytics. Uh, Bigtable provides the fully managed NoSQL database to serve these types of use cases for time series user analytics as well as others. It provides petabyte scale scalability for storage, high throughput and low latency for random access. And it provides uh, the ability to uh, seamlessly redistribute the data to handle increases in load and seamless scalability for ad while adjusting to the access patterns that you can put on it. And you can learn more about it at the URL. So Key Visualizer, uh, which is a beta now for Cloud Big Table, visualizes your key access patterns. It will help you find hotspots and large rows. And it's not just visualization. We also analyze trillions of metric values. It extracts the, pre, the key prefix hierarchy if it's available. And it doesn't have any impact on the performance of your cluster. There's a URL here that you can uh, go to for more information. Um, and then finally, some of the really key features um, that Bigtable and Key Visualizer enabled for us at Twitter. Um, it really gave us a very fast time to market on bringing this new improved advertiser analytics product um, up to scale. Um, additionally, like using Key Visualizer gave us really good confidence um, that we would be able to scale up um, and, and end up with a scalably designed system. Uh, we were able to iterate on the row key design 
way faster than we would have been if we had to infer it through other metrics like P99 latency, uh, things like that. Um, and then finally, it made it really easy to change the row key schema during development and just see what happened. Um, it let us iterate really quickly, um, but without going live in production and actually having to worry about impacting that. Um, so that's all we have. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>